one. Hey guys, welcome into the Stinky Truth Podcast. Mark Schler alongside my co-host, Mike Evans. Thank you so much for downloading, for subscribing. We truly appreciate you all. Mike, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. And uh, let, let's jump right into this with a topic we were discussing earlier this week, and that is Anthony Richardson tapping out of the, uh, the game, saying he was tired after a couple of runs during the course of a drive. Well, we wondered if that might have some consequences and apparently it did tell me if it was a direct reason why he's been benched and now Joe Flacco not only is taking over but apparently is the quarterback now for the rest of the season yeah I mean I I think there's a couple things here obviously you can't tap out of a game it just is it you know you're a quarterback for crying out loud stop it so you're supposed to lead your team. You can't go, I'm tired. I'm going to tap out here for a minute and come back later. I mean, it's just such a bad look. And it was such a, you know, just such a, just such a, just leaves a sour taste in your mouth as a football team. So that, that's part of it. And guys even were like, dude, like when I, I remember one of his offensive linemen was like, I think it was the center going, dude, like, you think we're tired? Like, do you think we're all tired? Like we're bleeding in front of you right now. Like, come on, man, come on. So, I, I think, you know, I think that makes sense. Really, the reason he was benched more than anything else, the guy's completing 44% of his passes in a league where everything is structured to have a high completion percentage. You're throwing screen passes. You're throwing bubble screens. You're throwing swings. Everything is quick slant game. You know, everything is a three-step, get the ball out of your hand game, underneath hitches and whatnot. Like, it never has been a time in the NFL where so many – Short drops, quick passing game has been so prevalent. So you should have a really high completion percentage because ultimately, probably if you're throwing 30, if you're throwing 30 balls, about 17 or 18 of them are going to be in an area where you should complete about 80% of those passes. So if you start to look at, okay, now the intermediate routes and a couple of the deep balls, let's say the intermediate routes we complete on average 55, 60% and the deep balls, maybe 35%. Well, at the end of the day, there's no excuse in today's NFL for not having at least 63% of your you know, passes complete on a rate, like especially with the sample size of playing seven games or whatever it was he played. So Like, you're getting benched on merit alone. Like, your merit is not very good. This was just the, you know, this was just the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back is is why you've been benched. 44% is, I mean, it's atrocious. It's awful. And so you can't compete that way. The other part of it is they're four and four right now in the, I mean, in flat out the worst division in football, the AFC, well, maybe it's the NFC South. Both the South divisions are awful, Right. They're awful. So you're four and four with an opportunity to maybe even win that division because the Houston Texans right now, they've got a bit of a paper tiger feel to them. They haven't been able to protect their quarterback. They've had a lot of injuries. Now, Stephon Diggs tore his ACL. Nico Collins has not made his comeback yet. They play Thursday night tonight when we're recording this. They haven't played yet, but they play tonight against the Jets. And so there's some question marks about the Houston Texans not being able to protect their quarterback. They're inside three guys, guard, center, guard, have given up more pressures. I believe I read this, more pressures than any team in football on their inside three guys. So this th- there's issues with Houston right now. And so you're looking at your football team, looking at all the veterans of your football team going, we actually got a legitimate chance to compete for this division crown, and we can't do it with a Duke that completes 44% of his passes plus – Here's a guy that doesn't know what he's doing, and we're going to go play Minnesota this weekend. Like, I'd rather have, even though Joe Flacco ain't getting out of the way of anybody, I'd rather have a guy that can dissect the blitz and throw it into the teeth of a blitz and create big plays because there's a saying in the NFL, you either die by the blitz or you live by the blitz, or you live by the blitz, die by the blitz. And if you're good at blitz pickup and your quarterback knows what the hell he's doing, guess what? You can eviscerate teams just like Detroit did to, you know, to a a lot of teams when they blitz them. Um, I think to Minnesota as well, scoring a lot of points. So like that, that's how I look at it. Here's my one issue though, Mike, how is it that guys on that roster are finding out that Anthony Richardson is no longer their starting quarterback via social media? I ask you, like, how is that appropriate? 
Is it just because of the nature of the position that like any other position on the team, there doesn't have to be a grand proclamation, but with the quarterback, it has to be. Yeah. No, I've been, I've been benched before. Like it, it was the most humiliating thing that's probably ever happened to me. I got benched in my second year and I didn't believe that I deserved to be benched, but I got benched and it was, it was humiliating walking back out there and all of a sudden I'm not the starter and I'm backing up. Um, humiliating, you know, going from starter to running the scout team drills, humiliating. Um, but I would say this for Anthony Richardson, it was one of those things where I critically looked at my game because I heard him say yesterday, like I heard him say something to the effect of you can't grade me like you grade a normal quarterback because I do things different. Dude, like that alone in my book will get you benched. Tapping out, like tapping out and saying, and then standing in front of the media saying, I was tired. You're too stupid to play quarterback for me. Like you just don't have enough self-awareness to play quarterback for me. And then to say, Hey man, I don't play like anybody else. So my scale is different. Again, that's just dumb. Like That's a stupid thing to say, but I will say this in regards to the Indianapolis Colts. It's a court. It's not a guard. Like I was it's a quarterback. And what you need to do is Monday after your game, you need to rally the troops together. You need to have your meeting, your, you, you know, your team meeting. And in that team meeting, you're saying, Hey man, we're sitting at four and four guys. Um, and as a staff, we've just come to the realization that right now, Anthony's young, um, inexperienced. He only started 13 games in college. Um, he's only started 10 in the national football league. He's very raw. He's exceptional as an athlete. But what gives us the best chance to win right now as a franchise in an organization is Joe Flacco playing quarterback for us. We've got a legit chance to win this division, and he gives us a better chance to win. That, like, you know, I always talk about being a professional. And just because you play professional sport doesn't make you a professional. Well, just because you run an organization, a professional sports organization, doesn't make you a professional in the way you deal with things. And that was a major flop by the Indianapolis Colts. Call it Chris Ballard, their GM. Call it Shane Steichen, their head coach. That's a major, major flop, not having that addressed in a team meeting. So everybody's on the same page. Let's get into some of these other matchups. We know Detroit's good. We, we know Detroit's good. So – that you kind of put aside. We're going to learn a lot about Green Bay this week, aren't we? As to yeah. whether or not this is a team that is truly a contender. Green Bay. Now, Jordan Love's got the groin injury. And he didn't practice yesterday. But I dug through some tape of Jordan Love. And let me just tell you, not only on schedule, he's great on schedule like orchestrating the offense the way that cramming up your cram hole of Fleur calls it. I mean, he, he does a great job of operating that offense, right? Getting the ball out quickly, getting it to the guy in stride, letting that guy make plays. He's got a young receiving core. They're a young football team. They can run the ball. They got all that stuff. They're, all, they're good at all that stuff. But where Jordan Love is really exceptional is when things do break down. His ability to continue to stare down the field and feel the rush. That's a talent. A lot of guys don't have it. He can feel it. Escape. As a matter of fact, the ball that he threw that he ended up injuring his groin on, he felt the rush. The left guard got beat, which is odd for a left guard, but the left yeah. guard got beat. Doesn't happen often. No. He never even glanced at him. He just felt it, took off to his right, rolled out of the pocket. The tight end broke deep. It was on an over route. He broke deep. And Jordan Love purposely threw it short. It was about a 25-yard completion, but purposely stopped the tight end because he was running right at the safety. And had he thrown it in, an, in a manner of leading the guy, it would have been either broken up, intercepted, or the guy would have you know lost some teeth. It was one of those throws. So it would have been a, a you know, a hospital ball. Mm -hmm. He was going to throw a hospital ball. And he basically essentially purposely throws the damn thing short, stops the tight end speed, the safety misses the tackle, and it goes for another 15, 20 yards. It's like a 48-yard completion or something. I mean, it was incredible. And he did it all while his groin, he pulled his groin pulling out or moving out of the pocket. So 
That stuff, he's exceptional. I expect him to play, but I'm telling you right now, in my estimation, watching a bunch of film, and I don't know how the Anthony or the Aiden Aiden Hutchinson, excuse me, the Aiden Hutchinson injury is going to play out over time. Um, I certainly don't think they're as good a defense because I think he was, you know, making a name for himself as a potential MVP, uh, defensive MVP candidate. But I still think the Detroit Lions are the best team in football. As a matter of fact, I was texting with Dan Campbell just yesterday, having watched some of that film too. I spent too much time watching film. I, I apologize, but watching some of that film too. And he just told me, I was talking about his receivers block and his receivers are just nasty. And he's like, we got a bunch of unselfish freaking, you know, unselfish players. And, you know, he, he called, he gave him a few expletives as a, as a form of endearment, you know, and I love that. But he's like, we just got a bunch of dudes that just want to go out and beat people up and play for one another. And they get excited, as excited, it reminds me of my teammate Rod Smith, gets ex- is more excited for a great block than he was a great catch. And that's an infectious, there's an infectious aspect to your football team. Dan Campbell's a hell of a coach. Hell, like maybe, maybe coach of the year. I don't know. They, he, he, should be in the, he should be in the conversation. I can understand, Stank, since you're calling New England and Tennessee this week, grinding through those teams' films, why you would want to watch some good film. So I, I don't blame you for taking a break yeah. from Tennessee and Titan film. Right. I, I, you know, I do this. I do this. Film. I do this weekly radio show in Arizona. And the host goes, I see on the broadcast schedule, you know, he's the <laughs> typical puker. I see on the broadcast schedule that you've got a real dog of a game, uh, New England at Tennessee. <laughs> and I said to him, I go, well, it's better than the game you're calling this weekend. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Better than the yeah. game you're calling this weekend. Hey, as much as I love to give you grief, and you know I do, you are one of a select few on this planet who are calling NFL games, my man. So, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, you're, well, you're it matters a little bit. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a wee little bit. But uh, you're still getting a chance to call NFL games, which yeah. is pretty cool. We will not preview Tennessee and New England. Sorry, Mark. We're not. God, I hope not. <laughs> We're not going to focus on that game. Um, if, if I think if, if you had told me that at this point of the season, we'd be getting ready for a Rams-Seattle game, with the idea that maybe the Rams are the team to beat yeah. in the NFC West? Who could have imagined that? Right. I mean, you look at it right now, Seattle 4-4, four and four, San Francisco 4-4. Four and four. You've got Arizona 4-4. Four and four, And the Rams 3-4. and four. I think they're 3-4. and four. But all of a sudden, they look like they're getting healthy. They got Puka Nakua back. There was a lot of talk about a trade from Matthew Stafford over to Minnesota. There was trade talks about uh, Cooper Cup leaving. And um, and yet, they they pull it all together. Williams, their running back, you know, runs exceptionally hard. And all of a sudden, they look like maybe they could be the team. Like, the Niners are getting Christian McCaffrey back, and he's going to make a huge difference with that football team. Um, and I would still probably pick San Francisco to win that division, but I will tell you, I called the Arizona Miami game last weekend. Arizona came back and won that game. And a couple of things happened in that game. One, Kyler Murray, who's really good when it comes to broken plays, that's where he does his most damage or first read of your progression, progression on the, on the quick throws. But he is so athletically gifted, Mike. My theory is, and I talked to him about the, his sped up mechanics, and he said, yeah, I got an issue with speeding up my mechanics. So the way an NFL, the way a passing game works, and our friend Joel Clatt always comes on our show and says, you know, the timing of the offense is kept in the quarterback's feet. I love that saying. I steal it. I use it. I yeah. usually credit Joel because he's not my intellectual property like you're my intellectual. Right. If you would have told me that, that would have been mine 100% because you're my intellectual property. You show far more respect to Clath than you do me. But, Way yeah. more respect to Joel Clath. I understand Clath. it. But, so he's, his mechanics speed up, and I think it's a, a combination of, of, you know, he's just such a dynamic little athlete. And so when you get your timing, let's say it's a three-step drop or a five-step drop, and goes da 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 and you hit that fifth step, 
and then the ball is out. Your first read, when you hit that first step or that fifth step in your progression, that first read is supposed to be open, right? So if it's not open, you you hitch up, and now you, you're ready. That second read should be open. So, you know, it's always kind of, I've always thought about this way, the way my feet sounded when I played. So what was show my feet like? It was an, almost an orchestra playing in my head. So if I'm coming off the ball and we're running 19 hand up, I want to hit my, my feet should sound like this. Da-da! Right? And that second step, that da-da! that second step is where I should be making contact, striking on an upward, not outward, but upward trajectory, creating an upward um, a, an upward trajectory for the defensive player, taking him out of the top of the stadium where I'm going to create leverage and then I'm going to be able to move him. And so I wanted to know exactly how my feet sound. So when your feet are in the pocket, you know, it's da 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 And then it's da da to the next hitch. da da And his feet go da da because they're so quick, right? They're and so his feet sound wrong. They sound, in my head, they sound wrong. I'll tell you. And so I saw him really slow down in the pocket. And his second and third reads, where I've watched him, I airmail balls, dirt balls, throw balls wide. Yet last week, he, he, he hit a couple of overs, low crosses, overs to Marvin Harrison that were money throws in the back of the end zone, money throws for a touchdown. And to me, it was because he slowed his feet down on those secondary reads. And it was like that was impressive for Kyler Murray and and they found a rhythm between and a route between he and um, and Marvin Harrison Jr. that I thought really worked well. It was all a bunch of over routes, you know, and and things of that nature, going from one side of the formation to the other side and catching on the opposite side. They did a good job with that. So if you still like San Francisco to win the West, what of the other three teams that we've been talking about here, would you give the best chance to get in as a wild card? Seattle, Arizona, or the Rams? The Rams. Okay. I think the Rams are structured. They're going to run the ball. I think they're physical up front. Um, Matthew Stafford is Matthew freaking Stafford. And when they have Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup, those two guys in the run game are exceptional and I always talk about to you this 11 and a half personnel kind of concept where they run two tight end plays out of three wide receiver sets. So why does that matter, right? It's just a play. Who gives a crap? But when, when you have the two tight end sets as a defensive coordinator, you're studying what do they run out of these two tight end sets? So you're practicing, you know, whatever they get in solo, a tight end on each side, or they get in west, two tight ends on one side, or they, you know, whatever, whatever their formation is. Oh, they can run this wide stretch with two tight ends. They can run this, da 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 da, right? And so those are the plays you run and you practice on two tight ends. All of a sudden, they get in three wide receivers. You haven't practiced those runs in nickel. When they get in three wide receivers, they're no longer in heavy formation or heavy defensive formation. They don't play base defense when you're in three wides. So all of a sudden, your nickel guys haven't worked on defending those plays. Now we get into three wide formation and we run two tight end plays that you haven't prepared for. Your nickel team, your nickel, like your nickel line or your nickel linebacker, he's a corner, comes in and plays mm-hmm. nickel, but he's playing a linebacker spot. Mm-hmm. He hasn't worked on any of that crap. And so you've got a, you've already got a, an advantage with those two guys in. So it, it's just unique. They're probably the only team that I watch that actually does that. Maybe the, maybe the Lions probably do it a little bit, but they're really the only team that does it with their receivers, and, um, and they're pretty damn good at it. Let's talk about a game that you and I have been talking a lot about on our radio show this week here in Denver. The Denver Broncos at five and three are a playoff team right now. And they're going up to Baltimore to play the Ravens, a team coming off a loss, but still a team that's, you know, widely regarded as a legitimate AFC championship contender. Mm -hmm. Is it time for people around the NFL world to start paying attention to what Bo Nix is doing in the month of October, Mark, of all the rookie quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, Bo Nix, Nix, is the top rookie in terms of touchdowns, 
touchdown to interception ratio, yards, uh, wins, all of that. Yeah. Is it time to start paying closer attention to Bo Nix and these Broncos? Well, I think that's why Jim Nance and Tony Romo are calling this game. Because people are taking notice. Obviously, the Baltimore Ravens are a damn good team. We all expect them to make a deep playoff run with Lamar Jackson playing at an MVP level and all that stuff. But all of a sudden, Bo Nix, you know, is is playing great. And that's why they put Jim Nance and Tony Romo on. So you play Jim Nance and I'll play Tony Romo. Go ahead. Go, just team me up. I'm Nance. Yeah, you're Nance. I'm Tony Romo. All right, Tony. uh, Bo Nix. What what have you seen when you look at Bo Nix on on film, friends? No, Jim. That's all you got, huh? That's all I got. That's the exact. (laughs) By the way, I love Tony Romo. I know. I know. I, I love Tony. I love that. You know where I listen to Tony Romo a lot? This is his serious form of flattery. There you go. You know where I listen to Tony Romo a lot? Serious is a broadcaster. End of half, end of game. Yeah. He's just because he's had to operate. Like, yeah. End of half, end of game for me. I was just like, give me the play. I'm fat and I'm tired. <laughs> that was a projection. <laughs> Snap count. Okay, I'm good. You're right? Good. You're right. He had to orchestrate. You know, you're, you're, or you're calling plays on the fly. You're orchestrating the whole offense. You're thinking about, you know, all the stuff you got to think about. Me, not so much. Where am I getting dinner after the game? <laughs> right. Are there orange slices available at halftime? Yeah. Um, I hope they have something to eat on the bus. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, the Broncos. This is a team, we we were well aware of this before the season began. I mean, this was a team, their over-under was five and a half wins. Uh, all kinds of off-season power rankings had them as mm-hmm. the 30th team, the 29th best team in the NFL. There were not high expectations. Sean Payton, though, came out because he was asked early in the season about their over-under being five and a half wins. And he said something to the effect like, um, the next time one of my teams uh, fails to win six games will be the first time that's ever right. happened. And what do you know? Here they are, five and three in your mind, has the timetable for this team becoming uh, a contender? Has it sped up and has it sped up dramatically? Yeah, I think no, definitely. But, you know, I, I'm sitting there. I'm, I say definitely, but I'm the guy who told you before the season started, pound the over on five and a half that Vegas was giving you. Pound it because they'll be better than that. And how much better I thought they'd win seven, eight games now, but I'm looking at, you know, the potential of winning 10 games. And, mm-hmm. This is going to be a big litmus test going out to Baltimore and playing this team. And, you know, one thing that that has been really good is this defense has been really, really good over the course of this entirety of this season. They're like third in points allowed. They've only allowed 15 points per game. They're like you know, third overall in yards per game. They're, I think, second or third overall in, in sacks and, you know, pass rush opportunity, all these things. But you got to also look at who they've played. Right now, they're winning the 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 winning percentage of the teams they've played um, gives them the worst. Like I think it's the worst strength of schedule. Um, it may be the worst in the league, but it's way down there on strength of schedule. But I think they're the teams they played are like eleven and twenty nine or something. So they haven't played a bunch of juggernauts. They've added to the fact that those guys aren't juggernauts, but. They've been really good, and I think Vance Joseph, their defensive coordinator, has been exceptional, Mike, in attacking protection, attacking what you're trying to do, going after that protection and shutting it down. So that's always one of those things that I think great coordinators have a good feel for what you're doing as an offense, understanding what the offensive issues are that you have and how to exploit those issues, how to find the one-on-ones with Zach Allen, how to find the one-on-ones on the edge. All those things are important, and a lot of that has to do with how you call a football game. And I think Vance has done a really good job with that. So I think they're a good team, but these next two weeks is going to tell a lot about the Denver Broncos. They're playing 
in Baltimore, and then they follow that up with playing in Kansas City. The Ravens, we know they have a dynamic offense. Number one offense uh, in in terms of yards. I think they're second or third in, in points this year. Prolific offense. But defensively, Stink, this team is dead last in the NFL against the pass, and it's not even close. They're 32nd in the NFL, giving up about 290 yards per game through the air. The next team, the 31st team, is Jacksonville. They're 20 yards better at 270. So there is a big difference between 31 and 32. Just how much of an Achilles heel is this for for Baltimore? Bo Nix was trying to be diplomatic and saying, well, the numbers are a little bit skewed because they play with the lead a lot. Is it a concern and how much? Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a concern, and he's right. Bo's 100% right. They play with the lead a lot. And, you know, because they control time of possession because their run game is so good, you know, you start to count possessions. It, it, you can't help it, right? You look at it, and they've eaten up the first quarter. You've gotten one possession, right? And they've eaten up, you know, 12 minutes, or they've eaten up 11 minutes of the 15 minutes. And so then you start thinking, man, we're not going to get very many position possessions, so we got to score a bunch. So, you know, what do stupid coordinators do? They just start throwing the ball on every down. That's that's the way it works because people are dumb. Um, so, you know, that that's that happens to them a lot. There's no question. The other thing I would tell you is very much like I said about Vance Joseph, Mike McDonald was a guy who was very tied together, very smart, and really good at attacking your protection, really good at – you know, at, at kind of being um, being multiple and um, having some exotics and getting to your quarterback through exotics. And I think one of the things that probably is surprising to me and a lot of people is um, they have not been great at the pass rush. They have not. Now they lost to Davian Clowney and they lost um, Queen, you know, the linebacker and stuff. But I think I think. This new style of defense they're playing under uh, Zach Orr has been less creating opportunities, less attacking protection, less about kind of being um, being exotic and more about just base. And I think one of the things we're learning is they're not quite as talented as we thought they were just whipping you man to man. I think a lot of this goes back to what McDonald was doing and they were a better defense under him because I think, you know, obviously a couple of players left, but I think for the most part, um, they were a little bit more tied together. Again, this is a first year for Zach Orr. Um, I, I play with his father, Terry Orr, um, which doesn't mean anything except that I play with his dad and they're both named Orr. So, which means nothing. Now that I think about it, I don't even know why that came out of my mouth. I don't even know Zach Orr. <laughs> but you know his Mostly father, who you played with. But I did play with his dad, and you know what that means. Circle's complete. Keep going. Absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but anytime you put in a new defense and you've got a new defensive coordinator – who you happen to know his father <laughs> means that you're going to, you know, it's going to take some time for that gotta thing to gel. Time. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. It's going to take it, time. It, Anytime it, it, you know somebody's dad, it takes a gel and boom. And, you, and then, yes. I'm sure if you didn't know his dad, it would probably take even longer for this defense to gel. So exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. why it's going to gel quicker than quicker. most people think. Because, you because got, yeah. I know Zach Gore's dad, Terry, because I play with him. And Terry, how, who I haven't talked to in years, Basically, sent a telepathic, telepathic, telepathic. Oh boy! Teleported a message. Why do you say that? How do you telepathy? Telepathy. Is it telepathy? telepathy? Telepathy. But is it telepathetic? It's telepathic. Telepathic, telepathetic, telepathetic. Your pathetic. This podcast is telepathetic. This, this last couple of minutes have been pathetic. So let's try to stay and get to our money maker picks. We'll get into some of these other matchups as well. Uh, I am a big dumb animal, people. <laughs> the comeback, the comeback that will be talked about forever is uh, is has begun. I went one, I went two and one last week. You went one and two. So you are fifteen eight and one. I am thirteen and eleven. So let's see if we. Can uh, continue to close the gap. You get to go first with your picks. All right, I let I let America down with my picks last week. Yeah, I got cocky. I got cocky. Mm -hmm. I was feeling my oats. Um, 
you know, I went with a theme like, oh, we're going to go, th- go big or go home. I remember saying it, you know, and I was going all. And then I just uh, basically took a dump in my hat. But that's OK. I'm back now. I'm back. I'm, I'm back. I'm, I'm seeing it clearly. I've got clarity right now. So here are my picks. Dallas Cowboys head to Atlanta. Dallas Cowboys, Jerry Jones just came out and said, uh, you know, he's looking for a storybook ending. Storybook ending. Jerry Jones is looking for a storybook ending. While other teams are, I don't know, addressing needs, you know, like going out and getting a receiver, going out and getting a left tackle, or going out and getting some player, he just thinks that magically, like a, a fairy is going to swing down and sprinkle pinkle, p- pixie dust, pinkle dust, pixie dust on the Dallas Cowboys. Like having a, like, y- y- having a y- hope without a plan, like, you have no actionable plan. You're just like, you're just hoping like you're it, it. It's so Jerry Jones. It's ridiculous. So I, I hear got the, he's got, I hear he's got the, the concepts of a plan. He's got the concepts. Oh, does he have the concepts of a the plan? Concepts of a plan. The concepts of a plan. I'm probably um, going to get cheat for that. I'm just making a joke people. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. You know what? He should put, be in put, charge put of the, the border. Put the fangs back in. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making a joke. Okay. Anyway, put him Lighten in charge up. of the border. Lighten He'll up. come up with a plan. Okay. There you go. All right. So I've got uh, the Atlanta Falcons minus two and a half beating the Cowboys. I've got my lines. They're just uh, the best team in the league. Yep. Minus three and a half over uh, over the Green Bay Packers. And then I've got the Rams, the guys we think are sneaky. Minus one and a half, I got the Rams. I'm actually going with a theme this week because your oh. theme worked so well last week, I thought I'd try my own theme. And I'm going with teams that have their quarterbacks now in place that give them the best chance to turn their seasons around. And I'm going to go with all three of them this week. I'm going to take Indiana, uh, Indianapolis with Joe Flacco, plus the five on the road against the suddenly struggling Vikings. I'm going to take Cleveland now with Jameis Winston energizing the Browns against a Chargers team I'm still not sold on. I get the Browns at home plus a point and a half. I'll take Cleveland. And I'm going to take Miami. Two is back, got another week under his belt. Buffalo's rolling right now. They got the they got a they got a hammer lock on this division. I think they might be ripe for a little bit of a letdown. Dolphins are desperate. I'll take Miami plus the six. I, I like that. Although Miami's one and seven lifetime against Buffalo when Tua plays. They're playing in early November. It's not December. The weather should be okay. Right. Different different circumstances. Okay, I'm just I was just letting you know they've been colossally bad against <laughs> Buffalo. Well, but you're getting you are getting six points. So yeah, exactly. They don't have to win. No, they don't have to win. They just have yeah. to come close. Exactly. Basically, kiss your sister. Game. Moral victory. All right, buddy. Hey, for everybody involved in the Stink Truth Podcast. What are you again? Uh, You're a big, dumb animal? Is that what you are? Yeah, I'm just a big, dumb animal. Big, dumb um, animal. Anyhow, <laughs> have a good one. We'll talk to you guys right. later on in the week. Yeah.